Uh, my first uh, panelist is uh, Laura Gomez. I'm not going to read the whole bio, bio because I don't want to spend the time. I'd rather leave it for Q&A. But all of these women have tremendous uh, accomplishments, and you can read about them here. So let me introduce Laura Gomez, who's the CEO and founder of Adipika. And she's also a founding member of Project Include, which is really working to encourage more women entrepreneurship. So take it away. Thank you, Thank you so much, Andrea. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of Atipica, and um, we are actually trying to raise our Series A soon, so that should be fun. <laughs> Hopefully, it'll be 10% instead of 8% um, next year. So I will just talk really briefly about my journey um, into tech and how I came to actually be up here. Um, I will also discuss a little bit about how I felt being in tech, not only being a woman, but being an immigrant, not only being an immigrant, but being... Um, a Latina in tech. So I was actually born in Mexico, and uh, my family had the luck or the greatness of actually moving to Redwood City when I was at the age of 10. So it was right in the heart of Silicon Valley where I saw the Googles grow up and Facebook. Um, myself, I was very interested in um, STEM since an early age, even when I learned English. This, my fifth grade teacher is my friend on Facebook. <laughs> um, she sent me this, she found on, on, in her... Um, in a, in a box somewhere, and so uh, she really pushed me hard, uh, not hard enough that she had to follow me through all high school where I took computer science, and then my, before I came to Berkeley, I had an internship at 17 at uh, Hewlett Packard. It was, I remember taking the bus from Redwood City to Palo Alto. Uh, it was on Page Mill Road. I think it was very interesting being in um, when software was still, especially consumer web, when the Googles of the world were still very young or were either founded that year. And I wasn't really into the software development, even thought I got a full ride to come to Berkeley through an engineering firm. Um, and so I came here, which I love, and I chose uh, Berkeley over Stanford and Harvard, um, mostly because I did not want to be very cold in, at Harvard, <laughs> and I did not want to be very near my mom at Stanford. <laughs> But I also was extremely liberal, where I organized a walkout when I was 15. Um, coming to Berkeley, I take what the other speakers are saying, um, and I hold my alma mater accountable to have kept me, not only back then in the um, science classes, that's too late, but all the young girls that actually want to st stick through their EECS classes. I didn't. I moved over, I'm better at writing, I'm better at humanities, I'm better at economics, I'm better at sociology, but I was very good at computer science. I just didn't know it or was too hard on, um, on myself. Either way, I ended up in, after my grad school in sociology masters, it was actually not at Berkeley, but at another UC, at UC San Diego. I ended up at YouTube um, right after another startup and I realized, oh my God, like this, is, this technology is going to change the way that people consume information. Um, but the other thing is that Google, um, YouTube at that time was acquired by Google like over the course of like a month I was there. Uh, but YouTube, uh, I was the only one speaking Spanish to anyone in the building. And that's when I realized uh, we have a problem. <laughs> and it's been a problem that I've been seeing since then and I'm hoping to work with Project Include. Um, through YouTube, I worked for several other startups and Somehow, someone, I'm actually watching it closely because I think it's going to get acquired soon, Twitter. Um, I ended up at Twitter as, um, I was overqualified, but I knew that this was a rocket ship. So I ended up at Twitter as the head of Twitter in Espanol and later on localization, which means not only translation, but localizing um, the user experience and the product into other languages. We localized over 50. Um, at one point, the first diplomat, the, the first diplomat that ever, um, that ever, tweeted in an official capacity was the Mexican ambassador, and he came to Twitter, and this, one of the founders was like, go find the other Latinos in the company, and I'm like, it's just me. <laughs> so the diversity component is so, has a lot of intersectionality. Um, this is me with the ambassador, who actually um, sent me an email that my mom has framed that says, you're, in, you're a pride to our, both of our countries that we both reside in. And so um, I believe that Tech not only creates wealth, um, it also creates social impact. And when diversity is not part of that conversation, communities are going to be displaced. Women are not going to be represented at the table. Um, 
what we see in San Francisco and Oakland and in other in East Palo Alto, what we're seeing that is actually making sure that families that have been here generations are no longer here because of tech. And so once we're passionate enough to be social, if we're social activists, we will be social activists even when we're technologists. Um, two years ago, someone called me and they're like, we're the editor-in-chief of USA Today. We are putting this hot topic around diversity in tech. I'm like, this has been going on since I was 17. <laughs> it's not very hot <laughs> to all of us. <laughs> it's been um, really quick. Just uh, decided to be with the Reverend Jesse Jackson, the head of diversity for Google and Facebook, and uh, uh, Richard Thompson, who's a Stanford law professor. And they called me because they said, we think that uh, someone needs to like, put the reverend in check. I'm like, that's great. Who's going to put me in check if I'm on this <laughs> panel? But that's when a typic I was born. I realized that the power of data and technology shouldn't just be used to like, have these discourses. It's actually to analyze how does machine learning interact with humans when they're reading resumes? Where are the drop-offs? Can, how can we understand better? Um, most of it is also, for me, is very important how Latinos are actually about 40% of the California population, but we're only three to 7% of the tech workers, women, Latina women are only 2%. And this is really when we're not creators of the tech that we're consuming, we're not in that part, we're in innovation apartheid. So really quick, where a typica is an artificial intelligence um, solution to how to, how to automate um, interrupt biases in the recruiting process. It's funny, I've had three competitors come out in the past week. I've known about them for a long time, but all of them talking about how their algorithms are really thinking about biases. And I'm like, that's great. When you take diversity as a business opportunity and not as an empathy and passion, I don't know whether you will be successful. Um, so we're doing that a lot. We're very lucky to work with a lot of great companies who actually want to analyze and use data driven. And lastly, I don't think that we need equality in Silicon Valley or any tech company. We actually need equity. And so that's the difference when, we, when I talk about everybody's like, oh, well, we'll, we'll give um, the same budget to our diversity team as our non-diversity team to go and do recruiting or retention or understand the employee experience. And I said, but you're, that's equality. Like, what they need is this. They need equity. And so thank you so much. I really appreciate it.